Along with the global pandemic is a contagion of fear that could spread faster than even a virus. It leaves us some hard questions to ponder. How can we spread accurate information better than the creeping paranoia and panic? How can we help protect the vulnerable and marginalized populations? Spread the word, not the virus. UNDP resident representative in China, Beata Trankman, gives us clues how no one's left behind in a time of crisis. Ms. Trankman once worked in China more than 20 years ago as a program manager battling HIV AIDS. She told me it was an experience she would never forget, and there are many lessons learned from then that we can still use today. Let's listen in. Right, so I, I think it's really important that we differentiate. We see where it comes from. We make sure that these things can't happen again. And I, I don't think in China it would happen again because China is, has a very different level of uh, development. But we also take forward what we know impeded the response at the time. Yeah. And that was the discrimination and the stigma. People were not go coming forward to get themselves tested. They would rather die yeah. than be tested positively. Exactly. And that is, is painful to see. I never forget that. 20 years ago, uh, I did my first assignment here, and I was the program manager for HIV and AIDS in UNDP China. Um, but I think the times were very different uh, 20 years ago. Uh, China was at a very different point in its uh, economic uh, development uh, uh, with much higher uh, poverty rates and uh, HIV at the time, uh, especially the outbreak in Hunan province at the time, was very much a poverty driven uh, epidemic because basically uh, farmers were um, giving blood to blood banks, selling blood uh, to increase their incomes. I think that type of uh, situation in 21st century China with the levels of development that China now has is, is close to unthinkable. But of course there are parallels um, or things that we can learn and then I think in particular uh, a very important lesson from the HIV AIDS epidemic was uh, how harmful stigma and discrimination is to an effective response. If people feel stigmatized and discriminated, they won't come forward to even get themselves tested and uh, uh, avail themselves of uh, uh, medication. And of course, with uh, antiretroviral drugs, you can live a fully productive, uh, close to normal life. Uh, but I think stigmatization basically prevents people from, from coming out. And I think uh, for COVID-19, that's an, a very important lesson because to contain the virus, we need to know where infected people are. And infected people need to be comfortable to come forward, get themselves tested, get themselves uh, treated. And of course, there are also economic aspects in terms of loss of income and how to make up for that uh, in affected populations, uh, uh, which uh, can be learned from the uh, HIV epidemic of the time. Mm. And not to link one place or one person with the so-called virus, with the virus, but rather let's fight it together. Absolutely, absolutely, which is also why WHO and the international community mulled so long over the name that they wanted to give the new outbreak right? and making sure that it doesn't get a geographical name attached to it because then again people from that area will be stigmatized just because of the place they're coming from. You know one of the things that UNDP has been working on is about how to deal with people on the edge. When COVID-19 sweeps the world, everybody feels vulnerable. Everybody, including all of us, feel being on the edge. Beata, help us to understand what can we learn from all of those experiences and best practices. You're quite right. All of us are vulnerable and all countries are vulnerable. And I think UNDP as the development organization of the United Nations system, who is indeed working with the most vulnerable to make sure that uh, uh, people can live fulfilling, healthy, and prosperous lives, 
since the whole world is affected, it's it's all about international solidarity and you know closing the ranks and joining hands and fighting this as a global uh, community. And I think what also is important to realize is I think these type of epidemics, you know, we like it or not, they're here to stay. This will not be the last one we're seeing, especially with you know population growth. We are supposed to hit uh, uh, 10 uh, billion people by 2050. Uh, you know, this sort of encroachment into wildlife uh, uh, habitats, uh, the close uh, coexistence between humans and uh, animals. So I think part of the answer, and that's again what we're looking at as UNDP, but also the UN system, is about uh, preparedness, uh, being ready. So being ready at the international level means that, uh, you know, we need to have strong global health structures, coordination structures, governance structures uh, for, for global pandemics of this uh, sort. We need to make sure that we have strong partnerships between research institutions and, and, and private sector mm -hmm. to be able to sort of churn out vaccines and, and medication uh, um, for these type of uh, occurrences rapidly. And then at the, at the micro level, we need to basically make sure that those populations who are most vulnerable and that is always the poor yeah. because the poor don't have fallback mechanisms that they can be protected and that we can increase their resilience uh, and, and that the responses uh, prepare communities to deal better with these type of occurrences that we will see in the future. At a time of crisis people have to prioritize. What are the things that needs to be prioritized from your perspective now? And as resources becoming more abundant when time goes by, what should be the way to reprioritize mm. in a way? Mm. This is so much to the key of what you have just talked about. Mm. China is a good example, right? Because China is in a way ahead of, of the world. So in terms of prioritization, I think first phase is all about containment, right? Making sure that it doesn't spread and it doesn't spiral out of control. China has been quite successful in this. Um, it, it's now largely contained to Wuhan and uh, uh, Hubei. People there have been suffering and they have my greatest admiration because they, they took the hit on behalf of China and the world, if you like. Um, but in the rest of the country, you know, infection rates are decreasing and uh, most of the new cases are imported. So now what we need to look at is basically how do we buffer the, the effects beyond the health parameters, the so social and economic effects. And there I think it's a, it's a two-fold strategy. One is looking at SMEs and employment and, and the economy, right? and how do we make sure that the economy survives this, this downturn and can pick up again and what sort of fiscal measures one has, etc. And the other part is, uh, is households, really protecting the most vulnerable households through, through targeted measures. Yeah. I know UNDP is not only working on specific projects, but you also work on advocacy. That's an important work for you, particularly now, mm. when rumors are flying around, the stigmatization is the, you know, him seems to be the characteristics of the day. You started something called uh, spread the word, not the virus. Mm. That's an interesting mm -hmm. campaign, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So how would you be able to, at a time when everybody is so desperate, be able to mobilize these people to participate mm -hmm. in your campaign mm -hmm. and also make them, every one of them, a special ambassador mm -hmm. of spread the word of science mm. and spread the word of unity. The reason why we came up with uh, this idea was that we realized, and WHO also, this is a joint campaign between UNDP and WHO. At the very beginning, there was all this talk about, you know, one uh, real impediment to fighting the virus effectively is all these rumors and conspiracy theories right, that will lead to irrational uh, behavior, what WHO calls the infodemic. Yeah. Right? So making sure that people have 
accurate scientific as you said information and information on how they can protect themselves and their families is extremely important to also ensure containment and make sure that it doesn't spread right the fact that we weren't shaking hands for example yeah. but in addition to that there is of course also from the UNDP perspective always that angle of the most marginalized yeah. community so in China we have ethnic minorities um, and where in particular the elderly generations can't necessarily read Mandarin, don't necessarily understand Mandarin that well. So making sure that those type of communities have access to information was, was the main idea behind it. So what we did is we recorded messages on basic hygiene and, and safe health practices mm -hmm. in 50 different ethnic uh, minority languages wow. and uh, and also some uh, international languages Asian and uh, otherwise European uh, languages it was all done by uh, volunteers it's crowdsourcing basically so people who participated are were young people who really wanted to sort of you know make a difference and mm -hmm. contribute and help China and the world winning that uh, battle and the beauty of it is of course you get an online community together who feels connected who contributes and and, and who, who gets a sense of purpose and uh, self-fulfilling uh, yes um, and so that I think that's why we sort of got so many entries and by now we have 34 million uh, views and still counting yeah. So, it, so it, you it you take a look at every language already they they uh, try to use. Yeah, the the team just uh, uh, two days ago released the final sort of wrap up video, and ha it has snippets from from all kinds of you know uh, people different languages. We have also outside China, Japanese, Korean. We have Icelandic. <laughs> Can you imagine? Cause other people to get the flu. That's exactly the idea, isn't it? To like the, is the small social groups that are yes. not necessarily exactly. going to have access to information. Now, the other thing about that is how you can manage to successfully engage the youth. So how would you be able to engage the youth during a time of crisis and make them feel that they are playing a huge role here mm. while at the same time they are? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I mean, I, I think we actually sort of, you know, across our program, we work a lot with youth because we also realize that youth is the future, right? If we are to achieve the 2030 agenda, it's the youth that is going to carry that forward. Right? And we need the youth and the young people who are sort of moving into future leadership positions to really sort of, you know, step forward. Um, also with their creativity, right? Because they oftentimes have a very different perspective right. on things. Uh, the use of technology, for example, they're much more comfortable, right? And, and as you rightly said, that sort of sense of, you know, belonging to something and being able to make a difference and having a, a sort of purpose in life is, is very important and I think in this campaign we had you know some really touching moments there's this one video of a, a young guy from Shanghai right who is in Shanghainese teaching his uh, his grandma and the elderly are the most vulnerable right how to wear the mask right so you get this intergenerational uh, element also which is uh, just beautiful the global pandemic sent shivers to the global economy Companies big and small have to grapple with the lack of consumer appetite and its lingering repercussions. The small and medium-sized companies in China, which in total contribute to more than 60% of the national GDP, have taken on a big hit. But with a slew of support policies, could they breathe a sigh of relief? Let's hear what Ms. Trankman had to say. <laughs> If I could ask you one by one some of the two important points you just mentioned about the small and medium-sized companies. Now we know with almost two months of delay of work as a result of quarantine, a lot of them suffer a lot. Despite of promising government policies, 
we're still going to see a very difficult time for them. What is the latest numbers and realities you have learned? Yeah, so, so SMEs are extremely important for the economy in China. They are really the backbone of uh, local economies. They are 80% um, of employment, 50% of uh, tax contribution, uh, so 60% of GDP. So they are really the driver of the economy. One of the biggest problems is cash flow. Most of them were basically saying, you know, they're, they're still closed down and they cannot survive. Two thirds of them said they can't survive uh, three months of uh, economic inactivity. They will have to close shop completely. So then the question is, how do you get the liquidity back into these SMEs? And the answer is um, trying to rein in the fixed costs that they have, right? Rents, um, social benefit contributions, uh, uh, providing also easier access uh, to credit so that they can get uh, liquidity yeah. injections. Those are all very important measures. And Chinese government is already taking these measures. Uh, the Beijing government, for example, has uh, uh, provided SMEs with a uh, break in uh, payment of uh, social benefits contributions. February to uh, June, they will be exempt. Um, tax breaks is another thing that uh, many governments are looking at. So, so these are the type of measures to, to protect um, SMEs as uh, uh, key employers and as a uh, uh, provider of livelihoods for people. And I guess everything has to be fast, right? We have to go with the changes very fast because things are changing fast. Having said that though, another thing you just mentioned, Beata, is about dealing with the vulnerable and the poor community. You know China has been setting itself the goal of eliminating extreme poverty this year, in fact. What's your latest observation as to whether that task can be accomplished with what cost? Yeah, that, that's something that we're watching very closely um, because I think it will be very important uh, that the effect of the epidemic doesn't derail uh, China's uh, attempt to uh, uh, eradicate extreme poverty um, by the end of the year. Uh, there is five million people still to be lifted out of poverty to achieve that uh, Xiao Kang uh, goal. And uh, of, of those uh, people, a lot of them have multiple vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. right? So you're looking at people with chronic uh, illnesses, you're looking at people with disability yeah. or the um, elderly. Um, so making sure basically that, you know, these people continue to be targeted as part of the uh, recovery response is I think um, extremely important. But then you also have you know, a, a group of population that lives just above that 2,800 renminbi uh, poverty line and that uh, uh, is subjected to other multiple uh, deprivation in terms of health or education or access to other uh, public services. So that group is 17% of the population. Making sure that these people, because of the effect of the epidemic, do not slide back into poverty is also going to be very important. Now how do we do this? Making sure that the worst affected poverty counties, that there are special allocations over and beyond maybe what was uh, planned to buffer that effect looking also at, again, liquidity of households, right? Deferring debt payments or other payments of poor households. Many of those households are relying on migrant uh, labor, the poor households. 30% of them is actually main income through migrant uh, labor. So facilitating the return of, you know, migrant laborers uh, to their workplaces is another thing that, uh, that can be done. Um, so, so all in all, basically looking at very targeted measures that address the specific vulnerabilities of these households. And you, as UNDP, together with the UN system, we're looking at understanding that uh, better to do a, a, a rapid needs assessment in particular in Wuhan and Hubei so that we can support the local uh, authorities in devising targeted measures that can uh, buffer these vi vulnerabilities and actually increase people's resilience so when the next crisis comes they're better prepared and we're not leaving anyone behind. 
a lot of uh, information to absorb, a lot of food for thoughts to, to take away from this conversation. Thank you so much, Beate, My for you and your team holding firm Thank to your task at this very critical juncture. Thank you so much.